thank you for coming. Uh, my, the title of my talk tonight um, will be The Laziness of Action. And it's definitely not a title that I have uh, coined myself, but that comes from a British author, uh, neuropsychologist, in fact, uh, Dr. Ian McGilchrist, um, who wrote uh, this book, among others, The Master and His Emissary. And uh, I will probably be referring to him several times during the talk, maybe without name, but you will feel that I have a certain interest in the relation between perception, vision, and uh, our brains. Uh, that doesn't make me a neuroscientist, but there is, it's a fascinating domain, uh, the evolution of the brain in relation to the perception, and of course the evolution of uh, technology, which are all aspects that I will be speaking about. I will then, um, sorry, I have to skip one, this one. I will then, during the talk, I will basically be touching on these few aspects. Sculpting with time, time as a volume, or time as a panorama. Secondly, what is monochrony versus what is heterochrony? Monochrony, we usually confuse with monochromy. But when I speak about monochromy, sorry, it's obviously a neologism, something I invented, doesn't in fact exist. Even heterochrony is a term which comes from uh, medicine. Uh, but when I refer to monochrony, I mean to the, I refer to the clock, to the time measured by a clock, or the time divided in equal shares which is a relatively young conception of time, and in fact a very artificial one, but a very rich one. Um, the question is, is that all there is? Is this the only definition of time that we should live by? The answer, as most of you know, no, of course not. Chronology or chronometry uh, is something we use for um, practical purposes, but out of that, of course, also comes an ideology. And sometimes I have a word of warning against this ideology. Then, related to the works that I will be speaking about, I will speak about the foreground and the background, a topic which is very present here in Prague, in the Olympia piece, uh, in terms of this is all about the background. And over time, the foreground, that is German historical Nazism, uh, Nazi architecture, and modernity uh, more largely um, fade away in favor for the background. So stories in the foreground versus witnesses in the background. And the background is, is often those aspects that are not invited by history, but that are just there. Trees, uh, the passage of time, the shadows, the sun, the weather. And these are my favorite actors, you will find out very soon. Then, of course, unavoidably, the question, is our brain a computer? My answer is um, simply no. Our brain is not a computer, although often it's tempting to think that our brain works like a computer. When I hear neuroscientists speak, but not only them, more or less everybody thinks about the brain as some kind of supercomputer or at least a network. You will always find back uh, the terms network, um, redundancy, you will, you will find a lot of references to the computer. But obviously if the brain would be a computer, that would make uh, us a case with in the middle of it a processor. And uh, if it would be possible to download our brains into a hard drive, that would make us uh, schizophrenic uh, creatures who are completely um, uh, alienated from their bodies. Digital matter is then the previously last one. I will not be talking about those so specifically, but digital matter is obviously all that which we think of as virtual as non-existent, as in between two worlds, as becoming, 
Um, and when I'm asked, what do you think about digital? First of all, I, you know, the first moment I don't know exactly what to answer because digital is such a large sc scope of things that you could, would say, like, you know, the same question would account for what is capitalism? Um, it's impossible to actually uh, uh, answer it without going into context. So I invented something like digital matter, which is not obviously my invention, but which is all that, all the effects that digital has on uh, living organisms, on human beings. And uh, what is digital? I would say, uh, with a banal answer, digital eats everything it can eat. So it's basically a transformative process, and whatever digital can transform into digital, it will. All those aspects of life will be transformed. Everything else remains somehow hardware outside of it. And the last one I've already touched upon is the analogy between the eye and the camera. Um, by working in 3D and by working, among other, in Olympia, I little by little uh, realized that uh, over the course of the past 170 years, as many people now realize, the relation or the analogy that we like to make between our eye and the lens of the camera or our retina or our uh, eyeball and the camera body is in fact a strongly ideological one. We don't see with our eyes. Our eyes play a minor role in our perception. So our vision is determined by so many more aspects than our eye. And I would say that the digital camera probably comes closer already to how our perception works in the sense that it uses the visual cortex to transform, uh, to transport, excuse me, uh, impulses and light information to somewhere else, uh, to the brain and to be processed together with all that matter that you have in your memory. So it's definitely the digital camera is, one could say, a semi position, somewhere in between. Then there is something that I have coined as, um, you see I coined a lot of neologisms by lack of anything um, more scientific, dark optics. And dark optics, one could say, is vision without the lens, vision without the eye. Um, it's a form of technological vision where uh, technological vision and the brain have merged into some kind of um, science fiction unity whereby actually you do not in fact need light to perceive. Um, I could also say this is the vision of the madman, eh, of la folie, la déraison in French, is vision where uh, the impulses from memory and from other aspects are as strong as those perceived from the outside world. I will come back to this, but I didn't actually want to burden you any more uh, with this because it's very, it becomes very abstract. I will then largely speak about three works which I have made and finish with Olympia. So Olympia is the last work I have finished. And Bordeaux Peace is one of my earlier works, which started in 2003, 2004. In the middle is in 2016, The Pure Necessity, which is a very different work. One would almost think it's made by a different artist. In fact, it's a different artist in me who made it. But what the three pieces have in common is that um, they rely heavily on the background to make a film and very little on the stories of the foreground to make the film. What are the stories of the foreground? They are obviously they are the actors, they are the theatre players, they are the screenplay, they are the script. There's everything that belongs to history, to narration, to the word. All these things that are actually, you know, people who like myself will say, have hijacked the beauty of film <laughs> very early after its uh, technological, let's say, beginnings. 
Um, so we had the beauty of the mute cinema in the beginning and then you know 10 15 years later you have or I don't know I forgot exactly how many years it took to invent the talkie you had the superimposition of words and of acting and of course that's a conflict between literature and theater and where uh, we have this monster that we know so well nowadays which is the moving image this strange existing together of sound and image which in fact do not belong together <laughs> but um, well you know I'm a, a rebel within that uh, a sort of universe and I try to fight it so I will begin with 2004 Bordeaux piece which is a, a in fact, a technologically simple work, but very exhaustive and very exhausting to produce. It took me, uh, you notice my gray hair, and I, here I don't have even any hair. When I began this work, I had a lot of hair, and I lost it all when I finished it. Yeah, that's a little bit the story of it. It was really very tiring production. It lasted, the film lasts for 13 hours and 43 minutes. That's essentially the time during summertime uh, from sunrise until sunset. And roughly the idea is the following. Oh, yeah, that's in between. Actually, this slide is on the wrong place. But that's only a kind of touristic uh, 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 venture into the collaboration between foreground and background, yeah? which is an example that I have always loved are the collaborations between Rubens and Bruegel, where one was very good in everything that is static and quiet and that is sort of the witnesses, yeah? and the other is all the corporeal, fleshy movement and action in Peter Paul Rubens. But they made, they, I think they, if I'm not mistaken, they made 24 paintings together. So, I jump back to Bordeaux piece. It's a single channel work, so it's a simple projection. And uh, we experiment a little bit with the way it's installed. Uh, but usually you put the headset on. There are a lot of headsets in the room. And in there are also speakers. And the speakers have the real-time recordings of nature, of the environment while we were recording somewhere else the action with the actors. So we split up the recordings of the actors and the environment into two. That was conceptually a given, is that we wouldn't combine them. So all the narrative is in the headsets and the sounds of the environment are in the speakers. So from sunrise to sunset. And here you can more or less see the succession of one film and one film is about 10 minutes it's never exactly the same because now comes the plot the, it looks like we are repeating we are looping a film each time and that you are like in a normal video installation you, you would see it again and if you haven't understood it you see it again you know, and after a while you're bored of it and you go out, yeah, you go to the next installation. But I wanted to do exactly the opposite. I wanted to make sure that if you go out, <laughs> you will miss the nice parts. Yeah? <laughs> and the nice parts are, of course, those moments of sunrise and sunset, when the sun is actually quite spectacular and comes into the camera, burns out, in fact, the image of the camera. Or in the evening, you can see in real time, you can see the sun setting, etc. The most boring moments are the moments where the museum or the art gallery is open. That's by day from 11 o'clock until 5 o'clock. There, the light is the most equal. Yeah? But here you can see, and in short, it's the following. It's an older man who is a film producer who is seducing the girlfriend of his son. So it's just a terrible little story of no importance whatsoever. He insults his son and then he kisses uh, the girl. So it's, it's macho, it has everything that it need to have to have a short, bad film. Yeah? 
And uh, in the end, he invites her to come with him to Berlin uh, because he's a Berlin film producer. In fact, I did that because they all spoke terrible English and we filmed the whole film in English. And so I said, okay, you guys are all actors from Berlin. Yeah, that's, that's the, that justifies the fact that you have a terrible accent in English. So that was the concept. You know, it's not a concept at all. And uh, some impressions of the, of, of the way it was done. So we spent about a month on location filming. But over summer, the sun changes quite rapidly. You know, the, the position in the morning in the 1st of July is absolutely not the same as the position of the sun at the end of July. And we had divided the film into, if I remember well, seven or eight scenes. And the actors had to play the scenes the whole day. And when they were finished with the scene, they had to start again until they started making mistakes in their lines. And of course, you can imagine in the evening, they make terrible mistakes. Yeah? Uh, they start mixing up their language, uh, a dog runs into the image, a car comes up the alleyway, all these things, you know, become part of the film. And we had made a little construction because I wanted it to... I am not a terrible bad camera, cameraman, I wanted to make the compositions good looking, but especially I wanted to make the compositions such that they would show the light, the movement of the light, and the movement of the, the trees, uh, the leaves, uh, the shadows on the building. So and here you can see towards the evening, he's still acting, but he's already completely fed up, of course. Huh? And th there were also, you can imagine, uh, it was a difficult production, people start fighting with one another, they become in a bad humor, because they're only allowed to sleep a few hours per night, etc. So, some impressions of the set. Also, this scene, you know, like the other one, is repeated almost 75 times per day. Yeah? So, no peace, no rest for the actors. The only thing that I was interested in, finally, was the movement of light and the shadows in, in the background. I didn't care how much my actors disintegrated. Yeah, I even enjoyed it, but I didn't tell them too much. Yeah? <laughs> and this is how we end each of the, of the shots. It's when the light goes down, when the sun goes out, uh, we, switch off, we switch on the electric light. And li like you can see, <laughs> all of a sudden you see the film crew in the, in the, in the image. So that's another little change which is kind of nice, but no one ever gets to see it because in an exhibition, you know, it's never shown. Um, but little by little, cinema start to propose to show the film it, in its entire duration, and that's kind of nice. Some impression of the recording. It was all done very low budget. I have usually not got the finances to uh, work with a lot of budget. Our main strength with our studio is that we have a lot of patience and uh, we have a lot of, how you say, stamina to work, to continue working for several years and blah, blah, blah. Um, and we are relatively independent. I strongly believe in that, yeah? You shouldn't be dependent on money for, well, a little bit, but not, not too much, you know? You can see uh, this, uh, the actor, the sun actor, is actually helping the uh, audio recording. And uh, we, there were also a lot of moments when there were clouds in front of the sun that we had to cancel the recording because we needed contrast light. So in days with bad weather or with, uh, when a cloud went uh, uh, over the sun, we had to cut and we had to, in the end, it became a puzzle about how many minutes of this scene do we still need at this time of the day. So it was a little, really a little bit complicated. So there was a lot of lost moments. And of course, fatigue. And then, some stills. I, I'm, unfortunately, I won't show the work because it will take us too long. I mean, I could, if you really insisted, show a few funny things, but I would say maybe after I've done the whole, uh, my talk, and if there are questions, then I, you know, I always have my 
stuff here. So it starts with um, a scene above uh, a town and you hear a man speaking and that's the film producer. He explains something on, uh, on the phone which is loosely based on a scene in Jean-Luc Godard's Le Mépris. But one could say it's actually a very bad adaptation of Jean-Luc Godard. It's about, uh, he wants to have a naked woman swimming in the sea and uh, for moral reasons, the producers, whatever, and he says, look, you know, I want it, otherwise I'm not paying for it. I want her naked, he says. And then he goes up to this porch, which is quite geometrical. He meets up with the girl. She will drop her cup of coffee. I think it's a cup of tea, in fact. And um, of course, she drops it 75 times. So it's 75 broken cups of, uh, of tea. So this is for the people, you know, who want to have a little bit of fun with thinking how many cups did they have to buy. Huh? So it's a way of referring to the loop, which cannot be a loop, because all the cups of coffee are broken. Yeah? There are always new cups of coffee. And then he tries to embrace her. Here you can already see the play with the shadows. So the shadow is quite, uh, behaves in quite uh, orderly, geometrical manner, and it just goes like that hour after hour. But for people who don't know, you know, it's not important. The most important for me is always that the duration keeps on running in the background. That's really my material. Is, uh, I sculpt in time. I don't work with film or with actors. I work with everything that's the background. So here he comes again, nicely composed, and while he walks up to the house, he's on the phone with his girlfriend, who's in fact kissing his father. And, but she's lying on the phone, she's saying, oh, where are you all? Nothing important. She doesn't know he's coming. So he sees her and he's very disappointed, of course. And then the father, or not the father, I mean, yes, the father, he will open the gate and he will let him in. This is all just pretext to make compositions with shadows and light. You see the importance of the tree. So he goes up, he goes up to her, they exchange a few words, then he goes into the house, then he goes up to his father and they argue. And in the end, his father, who's a real macho, he bumps on the window and, and he's, he tells to the girl, come on, let's go on my private jet to Berlin or something like that. Then the son opens a letter, which is of no importance, it's just only important that you don't know what's in the letter and he looks out on the same landscape and that's then basically the end but this is the end of one film and we have 75 of those so <laughs> it was a very let's say labor intensive analog way of uh, relating the foreground with the background just like one would do in painting you know, except And this is uh, a few impressions of the way the work was installed. So, the next work. I go a little bit fast, I hope you don't mind. But this is also a piece where the foreground and the background are uh, at the center, but in a very different way. I had a bad idea, I must say it was a bad idea because I regretted it, it was so much work. Um, to redraw the Jungle Book, 1967 Jungle Book animation. And uh, for that, in order to do that, I had to found an animation studio. Because in the beginning I thought I can do it with small manipulations of the original film, but soon I realized, you know, if you want to do it good, you have to do it with professionals, with young professionals. But what I didn't realize when I began this work um, is that uh, the Disney animation, the, pu uh, the Jungle Book, sorry, is considered one of the most difficult animations in history. And I, my project existed in redoing all the animals 
more or less faithfully according to the sequences in the original film. It starts with the village, then it goes into the, the woods, um, then there's the confrontation between Mowgli and, 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 and Shira Khan, etc. With the difference that there are no narratives, there's no actions, there's no Mowgli. There's only the animals that are in the original film, one by one, in isolation, behaving pretty much like animals in a zoo. So it's a very boring film, but in fact I, I find boredom interesting in film because it's always thrown into, you know, it's something you should absolutely avoid. Film is expensive, film people's time is expensive, we have little of it. So, and I, I try to use boredom. Um, I had to use it because I, I had been studying animals in animal parks and zoos. Uh, and I, I could not help but notice the boredom in these animals. Yeah? So I translated that into the film. Beginning with drawings, I'm um, a trained uh, uh, a drawer and painter. And then uh, we first made a, bl a black and white version without color. Um, because I thought that would be simple. So there are two versions, there's a black and white and a color version. This is a scene that we didn't do of a, um, an isolated monkey in, in, in prison. But the footage I got was stuff that I had filmed in animal parks and zoos. This was a difficult scene with the wolves because they talk to each other, they congregate what they have to do with Mowgli. And in my film they're only, you know, cleaning themselves, washing themselves, uh, taking care of the fleas, um, yawning. What do you do when you have nothing to do? Uh, fortunately, the uh, Bagheera is sleeping into the film, so I used that, thankfully, to make him sleep. There is also uh, the scene with the snake, but the snake just, you know, goes and checks him out. But when he yawns all of a sudden, when he changes in his sleep, unconsciously, the snake uh, is surprised and, and, and escapes. So, um, really all very simple scenes, but which required a lot of debate, of course, because it's very labor-intensive. And that's the final result. So, for someone who's not uh, initiated in the project, a little bit like with Bordeaux piece, will quickly think that this is uh, an adaptation of uh, the Jungle Book film, that I have somehow appropriated it. And it was often a debate of, for copyright uh, issues. Um, and uh, it's, of course, an interesting platform to discuss about copyright issues. Because is this theft or is this appropriation? <laughs> or is this an entirely new film? Um, it's really quite hard to say exactly what it is. Um, very uh, grateful boredom in the, in the uh, of course, the, uh, how do you call them? Um, vultures because they were lazy, they were unemployed, uh, they had no job, they just uh, look like passive onlookers to the scene that happens below them. But it proved to be one of the most difficult scenes to animate. And then some impressions of the storyboard. And here you can see a little bit more in depth of how, um, with my animators, we try to solve certain problems. If you remember, towards the end, Mowgli goes to the human village and he discovers this girl which is coming to fetch water. And she is singing a very beautiful song. But if your childhood was not too good, then the song might as well be a horror song. Yeah? So <laughs> it's not certain if the song is between magic and horror. And to me it was a bit of both, to be honest. I hadn't heard this song in about 35 years, I guess. And um, so the song became the inspiration of the work, in a way. Yeah? Um, is that uh, she, it's the first time where you actually have a human voice and a human person. 
But that's after 50 minutes of film, so it's a long time of silence. And then when she comes, it's a little bit as if you have the feeling that, you know, there's never been any jungle. It's like you're at home, mother is there, the daughter is there, she fetches the water. And it's very domestic, the song. It's about the girl doing exactly what the mother will do. She will marry to a husband who will go out hunting and who will bring back food while she will fetch the water and mother will be cooking in the home. But you have to imagine we are 1967. So we are actually not so far after the Second World War. It's really different times. Huh? And it's also a different way of being together. The cinema in 1967 is really a place to be together. Today the cinema hardly exists anymore. It's disintegrated into individual devices and individual consumption of whatever the content may be. You see how terrible it sounds when I say individual content and consumption? But in 1967 it was a form of being together in some kind of church where you didn't have to say anything to one another, you just had to enjoy the film. Uh, together you were... And also I was also thinking uh, why uh, was television and cinema so important after the Second World War? And maybe it was because uh, there was a lot of things about which you couldn't speak. You know, there was a lot of things about which you had nothing to say. You couldn't speak about the concentration camp, so to say. What would you say? So you actually sat together and you had a device talking at you and doing the thinking for you. Um, and that was my my idea was, okay, um, the duration between 1967 and now, are, indeed a lot has changed. Um, we are all individuals. And we, if we would then think about the Jungle Book, all the animals are retired, they have no more job, and they're lonely, and this would be exactly what they would be doing. And, you know. But I avoided sex for moral grounds so that I wouldn't run into trouble with children and with parents of children. Um, this is how we then film an action and then reintroduce it into the animation. It's really quite a hard job. It's very expensive to do. If I had known how much work it would have been, I wouldn't have done it. But also, sorry, I go back one more. Just briefly again about the background. Yeah? Uh, maybe you notice that there is a, a similar play going on here about the foreground being discarded, the narrative being discarded, the narrative not being important, and uh, the emphasis on everything that's in the background. What I learned after finishing this work from people who knew the story of the Jungle Book animation better, is that in fact Disney had spent so much effort and money into the animations of the animals that they didn't have the budget to take care of the background anymore. So they had to simplify the background. And if you know the film a little bit, if you look at it again, you see that the same plants come again over and over. It's always the same patterns. And they quite simplify it. But in the end, it's a, you know, a very fortunate marriage of uh, compromises. Um, but I, I was not aware of that when I began. And technically, the way I did it is I, um, I think either we developed the software or we bought the software, I don't remember anymore, um, to erase the characters from the backgrounds. And uh, so we were left with big um, plates, big digital paintings, so to speak, which looked a little bit weird, um, not always coherent, of the backgrounds. And from there we started to recompose the whole film with our new uh, characters. So it's an entirely new animation. There is only one scene which is original and which didn't make any sense to manipulate. That was the scene which looks naturalistic, which is the scene with Tiger Shere Khan going up to the deer and then being interrupted by the elephants. Some of you may remember that from their childhood or whatever, if you have children. Is that there's this scene which is a hunting scene and that one obviously I didn't have to change anything. 
So that for the pure necessity. And then last but not least, I come to Olympia, where I hopefully will be able to give you a little bit more in-depth um, impression. Of course, uh, a thousand years, everybody here knows that a thousand years are a complete impossibility for anything that's software. Um, but to make something with software and to promise that it will last a thousand years also is not that far-fetched because software, you, you, do, you never know when software begins and when it ends. There's no date to it. It's either updated or it evolves into another software, but it's something that is profoundly modern in the sense that it is made to transition from one shape into the other. And um, it's of course replaced all the time, but it's something of which you cannot exactly determine that it has a beginning and an end. So I think this was important for me to decide that uh, the Olympia piece would not be a film, but would be a piece of software. Uh, but it would look like a film, so it would look like it's happening um, in real time. And often people come and ask me, so where is the camera in the Olympic Stadium? And then I have to say, you see uh, the image 15 times per second rebuilt uh, live. Um, but I will, come, I will come back to that. F so, um, in the Olympic Stadium, this is one of the images that I had, uh, one of the snapshots basically that I had made on one of my visits to the Olympic Stadium in Berlin. I, um, I, I, in fact, I absolutely wanted to avoid to be a stranger in Berlin doing something with the Second World War, or with the DDR, or with uh, um, European politics, post-war politics, etc. I had seen so often really nice artists lose themselves into the subject matter of the DDR, Second World War, and you name it, because they were living in Berlin. And I thought it was an interesting tourist attraction for art. Yeah? And I really didn't want to do that, but alas, it happened to me too. Yeah? So uh, this, this is my take at a foreigner doing a tourist work in Berlin, because he spends a lot of time there. Maybe you can see in this image that there's a very systematic way in which the light falls into the gallery. And of course, uh, well, this is sunlight, but can you also see that the weeds in between the stones are higher when they receive more sunlight and that they are quite precisely smaller when they receive less sunlight? And I thought, you know, I only found that out afterwards. This was not how an idea was born. This, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Um, but I thought, hmm, that's strange. Uh, weeds, you know, when you think about weeds, we think about hippie <laughs> or about everything that is unrelated to technology. And I thought it's strange because the weeds behave in a militaristic way uh, according to a building that was built as a piece of theater for fascist era Germany. That is to say, it's, the building itself is a piece of theater. Yeah? It's um, very impressive, you lose your orientation, and when you notice the stones, they all have an individual character, but they're a little bit like soldiers in an army. When you look, when you zoom in, they have an individual character, but when you look at the totality, you are overwhelmed with the beauty of an army, and of course, the organization. The army in the building here is the columns. They organize the light and the shadows. So that was the first thing that I thought was really weird. And I, I have to remember that. So I started, I think, in the course of half an hour, I started to shoot dozens of, Im of images of little corners in the stadium that were not taken care of which is in Germany, you know, hard to find. Huh? It's uh, usually taken care of very well. And um, it's even... Germany, collectively, has a way of erasing history with uh, eraser yeah? quite carefully, 
by beautification, by putting another roof on top, by uh, letting football plays happening, rock concerts, etc. But they have a way of doing that. They have every reason to do that, of course. But my project was opposite. I, I took off the new roof and I didn't um, care for the plants anymore. I allowed them to grow in a virtual way. Here you can see, uh, this is a plan that we made and these yellow stripes are soft spots in the ground, in the earth, softer spots than the others, where plants will be allowed to grow faster than others. So this is a way of determining um, the soil underneath the building. It's entirely virtual, there's no photos involved except for the textures. I got inspired by uh, Chernobyl and Pripyat because simply there was a lot of visual information on the internet of a place that had been untouched by human hand for now almost 30 years. Yeah? And where I could study um, in Eastern Europe, I could study uh, vegetation, in a, actually in an environment that is not so unsimilar to uh, the Olympic Stadium. So the first months were spent with hesitation and with the study of plants, um, a little bit of reading of plants, and um, you will notice little by little that when I developed this idea of dark optics, that comes partly through this, is that when you no longer see, you have to read or you have to study. And when you study, you have to actually examine, examine the materials. You can't, you can't just go out somewhere and film something. You are dependent on knowledge. So what you do is you start speaking to one another. And in the end, you agree with one another that, okay, in Berlin, at the Olympic Stadium, there is this and that plant which come back. So basically what you do is exactly the same like in the pure necessity. You reduce nature to a number of assets. And this is exactly what happened in, uh, sorry, in the Disney animation, is that there's, there's four or five plants which come back over and over again. So there's this idea that whatever you leave to an algorithm um, is in a way a reduction. It's of course a richness somewhere else, but it's also of course a reduction. And I thought, mm, that's interesting. So basically, when we develop this work, we are amateurs, people who have no scientific knowledge, and no scientific background, but we quickly Wikipedia and Google our way through this knowledge. Yeah? That's what we do. And then, of course, a few books. Uh, but essentially, we generate this reality according to a reduced uh, state of affairs. And then that is, uh, for those who don't know, the Olympic Stadium. This is uh, aerial photography of the opening of the um, Olympic Games in 1936. There's a lot of fascinating aspects about this building. And I have to be careful with what I say, but there's a certain poetry to it as well. It may be militaristic, but there's a certain generosity in terms of the way the light, the sunlight especially, interacts with the building and with the environment. Um, and that's the difficulty, but an artwork maybe can do that. It can unite these things about which you could otherwise not really speak. This is a, a, a painted study of, um, well, it's actually not entirely painted. Underneath is a computer uh, line drawing. And I made impressions of how the seasons would look like. Autism, yeah, the autist in the computer. So I think I believe, I, I said in the beginning that one has to watch out comparing the brain to, to the processor or to the computer. Because um, the danger of, his, of it is that you would reduce the mind and the human being or the animal. Uh, to say it a little bit broader, to a process which is binary, which is basically based upon ones and zeros, and uh, which relies on computing. So, and here are several levels of computing. 
you compute decay, you compute growth, you compute light, you compute weather. So you basically do all these things that a complete insomniac autist would do. And you do it all the time, but you leave it to the computer. And while working so, you know, radically with computers,